Hi, good evening. This is Christopher Ram, welcoming you to Plain Talk, um, our weekly discussion program. Tonight, we want to discuss an issue that you will find, I hope, very fascinating. As you would have seen from the television screen, the program is called An Equatorial View of Oil and Gas. And for this program, we have, we are really blessed and privileged to have two very special guests. Um, if you don't mind, Sarah, I'll call the man first. Yes. <laughs> um, Mr. Tutu Alicante, and he's from Equatorial Guinea. Ms. Sarah Prey, who is from Open Society Foundation. And of course, we have our own two locals, um, Mr. Fred Collins and Dr. Troy Thomas, who have been friends of this program and no stranger to you. Tutu, he will probably say a little bit about himself, but he's from a country that is very familiar with the, the, the discovery and rapid development in oil and gas. He probably will tell us of some of the risks and challenges which is a society we face. And Sarah, um, with Open Society, you couldn't get a more transparent kind of, um, of name. So everybody, welcome. Thank, Thank you. you Thank so you much. much. Uh, Tudu, can I ask you to, just in a few words, um, say something about yourself? Most certainly. So first of all, thank you for having us, Chris. Oh, pleasure. Um, as you mentioned, I'm from Equatorial Guinea. And over the last couple of days, you know, I've thought of myself as uh, the canary in the mine uh, that comes to more than telling an exciting story, telling a cautionary story. I left my country to go study in the United States a few years after oil had been discovered. Which was which year? Oil was discovered in 1990. Oil started being produced in 1991. Oil changed not just the economy of my country, it changed the politics, it changed the social fabric of my country drastically. In fact, I went to the US thinking I was going to become a journalist. Instead, I decided to become a lawyer because I saw what, how oil had intricately um, connected everything in my country and was affecting every single layer of my country. And I felt immediately that there were fundamental questions of rule of law. There were fundamental questions of accountability, of transparency. They required me to be a lawyer and understand key issues that could change the future of my country. Do you think you succeeded in that? Um, is it just a journey? Freedom is a constant struggle and there is a long road to that, to achieving freedom. Same goes to justice and same goes to any principle that's worth fighting for. In Equatorial Guinea, there are several challenges today. One thing we have succeeded at doing is bringing civil society together, bringing more people from the country and from abroad to pay attention to key issues. I have succeeded at going to places and having people say Equatorial Guinea instead of Equatorial New Guinea or <laughs> Guinea, co confusing Guinea and Guinea I, Conakry. So there, I'm, there glad, I'm glad I didn't make that, commit that same <laughs> You. <laughs> You are a well-rounded man, sir. so I, I, I don't. Exp I know. I know you know where Equatorial Guinea is, but I live in the U.S. and you still do. Yes, sir. As a human rights defender, I am considered an enemy of the state in my country. Those very those very words have been uttered by the president of my country. But I live in the U.S. and I engage in advocacy in the U.S. and the U.N. and all those places. And you'll be amazed at the number of people that. These are congressional staffers, people in government. They're supposed to know about Africa, and they don't know the difference between Guinea-Conakry and Guinea-Bissau, or even Guinea, Equatorial Guinea, and Guyana, or French Guinea, Guyana. Yes. You know, so we have succeeded at certain things. Without a doubt, there is a lot more to be done. 
and that's why I'm here to uh, first of all look for allies to help me in my fight and also make allies you know because I think there might be things that happen in my country that I can share with my colleagues here in Guyana and hope and help ensure that people do not make the same mistakes that we did in Equatorial Guinea. Um, before I ask Sarah to respond, what kinds of mistakes you you're thinking about? What kinds of mistakes do you think you you, you made? Underestimating the capacity of the government to dig itself deeper into corruption. Underestimating the uh, tight connections that exist between multinational and multi um, multinational enterprises and our government. Sometimes misreading um, the connections between governments and institutions like the UN. To give you a very small example, Obiang at one point donated $3 million to UNESCO to create an award named after him to support science and education around the world. Obiang does not invest in education inside Equatorial Guinea. Why would UNESCO take that money? So underestimating, you know, the UN, underestimating the a the African Union, underestimating all these institutions that you know one would expect are there to uphold the rule of law, human rights, etc. Equatorial Guinea today sits on the uh, UN Security Council. That's because some of us, at some point, underestimated the UN. So those are things that you know. I hope my colleagues are looking at and saying, okay, we need to get our ducks in the row. We need to engage in broad advocacy not just here in Guyana, but in the U.S. where some of these companies call home. At the U.N. where some of these issues of corruption, accountability, are discussed. And elsewhere, perhaps in the inter-American or in the Caribbean courts and institutions. Sarah, would you like to tell us something about yourself and about the organization you represent and, and perhaps touch on some of the issues that Tutu has raised about from his perspective living in the United States of America and looking into his own country from that perspective. Sure, I would be happy to uh, and thank you so much for having me. I'm Pleasure. delighted to be here. This is my first time in Guyana and I've been having a tremendous time um, this week learning uh, so much about um, about your country and ab about the situation here and trying to see how we as Open Society Foundations might be able to assist in the fight to make sure that Guyana doesn't turn into Equatorial Guinea with this discovery of oil. Um, so as I mentioned, I work for the Open Society Foundations. We're a, a global foundation. Um, we work in over 80 countries around the world. We're um, a philanthropy founded by George Soros, um, and we focus on human rights and democracy. Um, I work for the Fiscal Governance Program and manage our natural resource governance portfolio. And we spend most of our time thinking about how natural resources can be better managed in order to benefit the most people. That's pretty simply put, right? What we want to see is natural resource wealth transform into wealth for as many people as possible. You know, too often, as, as Tutu has already attested, natural resource wealth does not have that impact on, on ordinary citizens, um, nor is it spent in the public interest. So we work with international organizations, some of whom have already um, come to Guyana and, and started to, to work both with government and civil society here to, to see how they might be able to assist. And um, what I'm focused on and, and what I hope to do um, for years to come is work with civil society in Guyana to see how we might be able to support them. So we, for instance, have started to support Transparency Institute Guyana Inc. Um, and um, we're delighted to be working with them and other members of civil society here. The last thing I'll say is we truly believe that even the best intentioned government cannot fulfill its promise to its people to, to spend these resources wisely without a robust, strong civil society that is there to ask the tough questions, to look over you know, the budget, we were talking about the budget, to look over contracts, look over you know, revenue, generation spending, et cetera. It, a civil society is absolutely essential to realizing um, the, the maximum benefit. And you know that's one of the reasons why Equatorial Guinea is the way it is, is because of that lack of civil society. And thankfully, we've already found so many partners with, with whom to work here in Guyana. We want to continue to do so. And um, you know, luckily, we're here at a time that 
we weren't able to do in Equatorial Guinea. Yeah. You know, Tutu was not asking these questions before the oil started production, right? It was years after. We're here having these really important conversations facilitated like peop with by people like you before there's even been oil. And so we're at least ahead of the curve on that. This business of civil society and mm -hmm. the challenges, um, how powerful are those challenges? And do you think um, we, as you said, I, I think you said underestimated, um, are we a bit too idealistic about the extent of the challenge? And for example, in oil and gas, often you're not only fighting the, or, or you're not only confronting um, the international oil operators, you're confronting your own government. Mm -hmm. Do we, how, how, how does, how, how do you help our nascent civil society to understand and appreciate the, the magnitude of the task they're up against and, and perhaps sure you could come in front you can come in and say what you, how you see the, the, the challenges and, and, and perhaps they might you know we have this discussion openly about how we can help well maybe you, you, you all can talk about the paper that we launched today because I think that you know we, we, we just had an event at uh, Mori House Trust to launch this paper that looked at the case studies of Equatorial Guinea and Timor Leste and obviously the political contexts are different economic contexts are different etc but similarly sized populations etc and drawing lessons from from those case studies and and others to, to see how they apply to Guyana I think that's part of it right because we can we can learn from them what lessons um, you know, we might be able to avoid here. What would you say, Troy? Well, I, I, I want to, um, to, in direct answer to uh, Chris's question, um, there, is, there is so much that um, comes to, to, to mind in a, in a question like that. But I perhaps should begin by saying that um, my observation is that uh, most of our people, um, the emotion that seems to be dominant is something between um, they are kind of a uh, kind of cynicism about how what will happen to the um, oil wealth, and um, uh, they are in a, there are others who seem to be in the honeymoon stage, all excited about it. Um, so the question is, how do we make our people aware of the the dangers? The pitfalls that lie ahead, as our brother from Equatorial Guinea has already begun to point out, without appearing to them to be wanting to rain on the oil parade and, um, you know, attempting to uh, be some kind of a, a detractor from this great, bountiful wealth that our uh, leaders are telling us that will shortly be our you destiny. Us, yes. And so the challenge <laughs> is, a, is a serious one because it affords a lot of opportunity for charges to be leveled about um, people um, being negative <laughs> as, as, as if the papers are not chock full of the kind of shenanigans that oil companies play, the kind of games that they play. This is, this is an open secret around the world. And uh, these uh, 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 games they play are invo involve some of the companies that have become prominent names in Guyana. I'm putting it as politely as I can. Sorry? <laughs> um, from the civil society perspective, there, there are important challenges. Um, the, the one that I think we have definitely got to overcome is the challenge of organizing ourselves. Um, we each sometimes work on, our, on the issues we're focusing on. Sometimes we work on the same issues but separately. And when it comes to oil, because of the, the potential impact of it on our society, positive and negative, depending on how um, the systems are implemented and managed. I think it's essential that we come together and sort out our priorities and speak with a single voice 
on matters. Who is that we you talk about? Um, who, whose challenge it is, or who is that way? Yeah, no, you, you said we, we come together and speak with a single voice. Yeah. Who is this we? I'm talking about... Just civil society. I'm talking in this instance about civil society. Um, so we have... Civil society, individuals in civil society and organizations in civil society have said certain things about oil, oil well, about the dangers of not putting systems in place. But sometimes it's, it can be a bit disjointed. So what I'm, what I'm saying is that we need to come together and, and this is something that we want to do as an organization, get civil society together to set a, an oil and gas governance agenda that we can all get behind. So it's not any specific organization's program, it's a civil society program. Um, so that's one challenge and I think we, we have to overcome that challenge of um, uh, working in our separate spheres. And there are a few examples of, of um, uh, the kind of partnerships that I'm talking about. Like, for instance, Policy Forum is, is an example that draws from several organizations. Um, the next challenge we face, and this is a major one, is perhaps a government that might have decided on certain things already. Um, and that one... Uh, I think that's where the strength of our numbers and collective voice um, will have to come into play. If a government has decided that it will do this, and we believe it should go somewhere else, and we do not organize ourselves to try and effect those changes, then the government goes ahead and does what it wants to do. In this, there is a role for the citizens at large as well. but. I think civil society has to find ways to organize the citizens. Fred talked, spoke about educating people. That's one of the things we have got to do. Um, and get the masses behind uh, you know, a governance agenda for, um, for oil and gas that is driven by, by people, not from the government down. So that's, that's how I see you know, um, uh, an approach to our addressing the issues with oil. Sarah, you, you, you must be confronted with this fairly often. <coughs> Civil society are self-appointed people. Mm -hmm. they, they may mean very well, they very generous, very honorable in their intention, but they're not elected. Mm -hmm. Governments are elected, and we accept democracy. Yeah. And the government has an agenda. Sometimes it's hidden, Sometimes it's nefarious, but how, in order to get civil society to work as a united force, pardon the pun, how do you, how do you relate to government as a civil society? Where is your legitimacy? It's a huge question, um, obviously not unique to, to this context. I absolutely have seen this in every cr country in which I've, I've worked um, on these issues. And what I will say is, first of all, during this week, this question has come up a lot. So I have no concerns that, you know, th that the civil society folks here aren't thinking about that question constantly and, you know, figuring out which communities can talk to which communities and you know who is targeting the youth and who's targeting you know this region and that region so it absolutely is on the table here and and I've seen that in other countries as well that there is um, understandably a tendency of, of donors to support groups in capital cities because it's easier um, elites that are better at writing proposals or you know speak a certain language and and that we need as donors to directly confront that and and be mindful anytime we're entering a context to ask who are these folks representing and how are they being held accountable and you know that's one thing that we look at a lot as an institution is we look at matters of, of go governance of these organizations you know do they have a board who's on that board um, you know how, how are they seeking um, to, to understand their impact and you know, making sure that you know they're they're being as effective and strategic as possible. So it's a huge question, though. You're absolutely right, and one that I certainly don't have the answer, but um, that we we grapple with, and and it, it seems like the folks here are as well. How has that question been arisen and dealt with in in your country? So 
the first thing I would say, you know, is that that's a question that my government and governments tend to use to divide civil society, right? And it's one that, you know, in our context, we have always have to be very cautious about and take steps to ensure that, you know, we, uh, when we say, when I go out there and say, I am a youth organization to ensure that, you know, my members are young people yes. that work in the communities that they come from. And when I say I'm a national organization, I make sure that you know I have someone from Anobon, someone from Bata, someone from etc. And when I say I'm a women's organization, that there are women in the organization, you know. So uh, undoubtedly, as Sarah mentioned, you know, this is a huge question. Um, it is, it is, at least in my mind, it is a lot easier for me to understand someone that's not getting paid someone that is uh, not at risk of being bribed, uh, not at risk of entering any deals. But there will be very few people in any society with that, <laughs> in that position. But someone that comes from that position and tells me I'm rep working with youth, an altruistic, altruistic person that comes and tells me I'm working with youth, in my mind tends to do a better job at representing that youth than a politician that is running a campaign and is getting elected and often getting uh, subsidies from some companies to say, you know, they're representing a, re uh, a region, right? So it is a hard question. However, uh, as you pointed out, you know, these are people that are doing this uh, out of the kindness of their heart. When I left uh, law school, I could, in fact, many people advised me that, you know, the way to bring about change in your country is get a job with ExxonMobil and change from within, right? Help them understand the importance of changing laws. I know many of my colleagues that went to school with me, they're working for ExxonMobil or has all these other companies in my country and nothing has changed. Um, and I'm not saying that, you know, it is justice and what we're doing has changed everything drastically in the country, but I am respected when I go to the UN, when I go to the US, when I go to certain places and say this is a problem, this is an injustice, and we have to take it seriously. Good. Sure, by all means. I, that, that question you asked about uh, where the legitimacy uh, comes from is a serious question at this time as transparency sees it in the development of Guyana. As I was mentioning in one of our sessions today, I don't know about you, Chris. Um, you're a little older than I. Much older. <laughs> a little older than I. And I have no recollection of my civic education, including what is expected of me in representing the interests of the society at large and speaking truth to power. For example, in the United States, they are taught that they have a right to demonstrate mm -hmm. in the face of what they deem to be injustice. I do not know if in your education at any time you have been given that kind of um, di di uh, uh, guidance as to what is expected of you. In fact, my recollection is that as the as 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 I as I grew up, um, our politicians interpreted and tried to to tell us and to if not in so many words what rights we did not have. So at this point in time, when we have something as uh, f f for for me, it's an existential issue to Guyana. It will determine whether this country um, ex 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 even exists in a matter of um, uh, 20 years or, or in any kind of functioning. Aren't you being overdramatic? Yeah? Maybe, but I like to be. <laughs> and um, uh, uh, you, you, you will allow me that luxury off the stage. Absolutely. <laughs> but um, <laughs> the point of the matter is, to answer the question, um, we have something that says sovereignty belongs to the people. Is that is somewhere yes. in our constitution. Yes. And the task that we have is to convert that so that our I I into something meaningful. So our young people do not grow up the same way as we did. They need to 
take that and interpret it in a way that makes them recognize that they are meaningful stakeholders in whatever develops in this country and be able to represent the interests of the youth and as they grow up in the face of whatever extremes our politicians may want to go. So that, that for me is a serious question from a macro standpoint. Well, I, I would have liked to answer it and, and we're probably going to talk another time about it because I, I grew up pre-independence, students companion, you did civics as a subject. Um, and, uh, and the irony of it, the paradox of it, is that that was in pre-independence. Mm -hmm. That's what, when we were being ruled from London. That's it. That's the irony. But uh, uh, because the viewers would, would want to know about, we're talking about oil and gas and the perspective yeah, from it. And I was yes. talking about yes. oil and yes. gas. <laughs> now, <laughs> when I, I've heard um, this, this issue of ExxonMobil, mm -hmm. to, to mention it, and often it connotes a, a, a negative um, feeling, a negative sound, a negative meaning. Are we doing the right thing Sarah. to do? Are we doing the right thing by somehow trying to demonize the oil companies? Mm -hmm. um, and should we not realize, look, these are people like you and me. They're, they're, they're doing a job. They're, they're, you know, an organization is made up of people. They've got their own personal feelings. If they've got their organizational obligations, but um, are there not people we ought to be able to sit down with, mm -hmm. and, and that we should sit down with, and try to, to to say, look, you know, you've got your interests. We have our interests. Let's talk. Mm -hmm. um, so for me, the fundamental question that every Guyanese person has to answer is whether oil becomes a blessing or a curse. Oil is a double-edged sword, is a, is a coin. Right? But is that, is that an issue? Um, who, is, who can prevent that? Is it the oil company or the government? It's every single individual in this country. Our actions, our inactions, our decisions determine whether the oil becomes a curse or whether oil becomes a blessing. What so do you mean by oil, beco oil becoming a curse? Equatorial Guinea is a perfect example of what happens when oil, the supposed to benefit the people, goes towards benefiting one family. You would be surprised to know that the president of Equatorial Guinea is listed in the Forbes list of most of richest presidents in the world. The son of the president of my country has been prosecuted in at least three countries and his assets have been seized in four countries. Um, just a couple of months ago, they caught the son of the president of my country in Brazil, not too far away from here, um, with 21 watches, 21 watches, oh, yes. they were worth $16 million. Gold and cross today. This is, this is so, I mean, so a situation where 800,000 people, majority of them are living on less than a dollar a day while the son of the president, while the family of the president is worth millions and millions of dollars, is a situation where oil has been squandered. And that is oil becoming a curse. A situation, however, where oil goes either in a fund or just directly towards building schools, building hospitals, building roads, ensuring that homelessness and all the issues are dealt with, is a situation that you know I would consider a blessing. Now, there are human beings making those decisions. One of them, one of them being oil companies. Um, so we're talking about Exxon because Exxon is going to come here. When Exxon came to my country, there were no oil law. Oil, as I mentioned at the beginning, started being produced in 1991. The oil law in my country, and I can send you the link to it, was signed in 2006. And when you look at the law, you can tell that that law was not drafted by Equatorial Guinean lawyers. So, on, on what arrangements did they did they operate in your country? There, <laughs> my country is a dictatorial country. The dictator decides what the arrangements are. Uh, most likely in a room with uh, Mr. Rex Tillerson in Houston, and that is the fundamental problem with some companies, 
right? Whether they're gonna come here and abide by laws and ensure that all necessary or relevant stakeholders are at the table, ensure that you know all the economists and lawyers they have to review things, review things before things are signed, right? And those are things that you know any of these oil companies would do in the US or anywhere else they operate. But they tend to come to places like Equatorial Guinea, think we are a banana republic and take advantage of the situation and draft contracts that you know would be unconscionable anywhere else. Sir, um, how do you how does your organization with its its, its broad mandate um, seek to address that kind of problem? And, and, and I, I'll ask you, as as an American, I, am I right in assuming that? I'm half Canadian, but half yeah, Canadian. we'll go with American. <laughs> <laughs> oh no, no, I don't want to start that. I don't want to start that. Um, how do you how do you avoid that kind of sit that situation well I'll tell you we've been working on this issue for decades and I don't think we've quite found the solution yet so um, I wish I could give you the magic formula um, but we don't have it and what we've seen time and time again is um, systems and institutions that are put in place even with the best of intentions often still don't deliver the results that we want to see so I think it's a it's 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 a combination of many things one of which is absolutely getting the right laws the right regulations in place that will ensure the most transparent and the most oversight and accountability as is possible for from you know the the moment of deciding to extract the resource all the way to spending the money um, the revenues um, and so that takes political will on the part of the government to do the right thing. It also takes, as we've been talking about, civil society that is there every step of the way to assist the government when appropriate in, in writing the laws, in, 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 in oversight, and then when necessary, calling them out when they're, when they're not doing the right thing. Um, and, and companies can be a force for good, and they can be a force for not so good. And, and they're not going to solve the problem here. That's for sure. It's going to be the government and, and civil society working together and with the people b behind it, as, as Tutu has mentioned. Um, but I think it's, it's for the reasons you said, the company is here to make money. I mean, that's what companies are here to do. They are not here to make sure that this m money goes where it should go. I think, I think one other way that, and I cannot speak on behalf of uh, Open Society Foundation, but one, as someone that has worked for the open so with the Open Society for many years now, I can say that uh, Open Society makes available to civil society economists, uh, lawyers, and many people, they have uh, very valuable experiences, right? Uh, the uh, NRGI, who I believe was here not too long ago, is a grantee of the Open Society Foundation. Natural and Resource Governance Institute. Yeah, yeah. perfect. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, they've come here, they've gone to other places, you know, where their expertise can be relevant, you know, and that, all that helped. The fact that I'm here is because Open Society Foundation sponsored my trip here, you know, and I would like to hope that, you know, I've become a resource in years to come, you know, for my colleagues here in Guyana. Fred and Troy, uh, y you've heard um, to, to speak of, of the situation in their country when, when oil was, uh, was discovered um, and, and what is still happening. We're not that bad. <laughs> and how do we prevent yes. getting there? Well, I think you're right in saying that we're not bad if we can characterize it that way. In the sense that we have, um, we have certain systems in place um, we're a democracy, that sort of thing. Um, but the, the examples out there indicate to us that it's not necessarily the governance, the system of governance that would have led to the consequences of oil in Equatorial Guinea. No doubt it has led to some of the consequences. But we've seen, for instance, one of the examples, timor -Lest, uh, they set up and had one of the most transparent uh, fund, sovereign wealth fund. Uh, was it number seven in the, in the world? Number seven, the most transparent. Country. And still, I think it's by 2025, mm -hmm. it should run out. And the reason is it's transparent, but what are they doing with it? Mm -hmm. um, so 
we are we are we are in a position to take all of those examples and um, determine the best path for Guyana. What needs to happen, however, I I think government has to continue to be receptive to civil society um, and the views from civil society at the same time civil society has to make sure that it organizes and uh, you know expresses its views on issues that are important and that might cause the greatest change i mean sometimes we, we go off in several directions sometimes all important but i think we need to come together in that that one voice and i think that's that's key what can happen otherwise is that government goes ahead with whatever it thinks it's be is best, but government don't often have the same incentives or disincentives as you know civil society uh, uh, might have. Well, I don't. I I I am not as enthusiastic as Troy. I think we don't even know how bad we are. <laughs> we don't know how bad we are because what. There, there are some features. We, we do have democracy. We hold on, hold on, hold on. Hold on, hold on no, let me explain I, myself. Yeah, okay, <laughs> let me ahead. explain myself. <laughs> number, number one, this country only knew that there were oil companies exploring for oil in Guyana's waters. The first time we knew that is when the Suriname gunboats put yes. out CGX. Our leaders did not tell us anything about it. So what we're seeing is that oil and the relationship between governments and oil companies, that relationship results in concealment. Concealment of the contracts, concealment of the activities. So I don't know how we know. Now let me talk about the laws. Kamala Passat, the assessor, came and she made a great suggestion that we should put the legal structure in place that assumes that assumes that the culture in your country is one which honors the laws we have a culture that seems to be one in which the leadership decides which laws it is going to honor and which laws it is going to ignore. But, but, but Fred, I mean, I, I'm not trying to defend it, but we do have, have admin law as well. And admin law does allow, if, if any state official violates any law, then you can seek redress from the court. You can, you can get the court has the power because of the constitutional position, separation of powers, that you can approach the court. I know the difficulties, but we do have that facility that is uh, that is well you ask you ask both of us a question i'm i'm, I'm answering it. Sure. it seems to me it seems to me that we have laws that are ignored and with impunity for instance and it seems to me with collusion of the legal fraternity for instance and thankfully, laws, <laughs> laws. Sorry, 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 sorry. No, 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 don't take. <laughs> but let me give you. Let me give an example. Fortunately or unfortunately, the laws of the land are written in plain English. There's a law that speaks of the pro the rules of procurement in this country. But not only the Procurement Act of 2003. The Constitution believe it or not, refers to procurement and goes out and takes expression in the law more clearly that says that both goods and services, I'm saying it is in plain English, and maybe someday they say the law is an ass, somebody will show me why it is not applicable. They didn't say the law is an ass, they said if a certain situation prevails, then the law must Thank be Thank you, ass. good. <laughs> well, sometimes it's quoted without the handle, so yes, I, I, know. I only know the tale. <laughs> But um, <laughs> so it's written in plain English, and yet, what obtains in all those countries with great laws that you have? Uh, the oh, oh, and by the way, the law speaks of goods and services in plain English, and what you have in other countries where the award of contracts is the subject of public tender is ignored ignored completely in a context in which 
when mining uh, uh, licenses are awarded for land, it is subject to, um, to tender. There's a, there's a tradition and practice of that. So we have a law which speaks in plain English that suggests to a person who understands a few nouns and words like me that it says clearly all goods and procurement of all goods and services above a certain amount must be the subject of public tender. And don't tell me that it was waiting on the setting up of a procurement commission because prior to the, uh, the it was the practice for uh, public tender for, for, for loads etc etc nobody has been able to show me why petroleum is excluded it, there, there is no such exclusion I am saying to you that I cannot agree with my brother Troy that we might be in a better position I am saying that from what I am seeing, the laws of the country are ignored with impunity and perhaps with collusion. It is as though there's a hypnotic blindness to laws which ought to be applied, which if those laws are, uh, 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 are applicable and they, are, they have been ignored, it says to me that all contracts that have not been awarded according to the Constitution and that, that are invalid. Well, a contract is invalid when it's deemed invalid by a relevant authority. It's not just um, emotionally invalid. But I understand your concerns, Fred. We also happen to have, um, we have the, the law, the Petroleum Exploration Protection Act. We have the legislation. We have had the benefit of the contract because civil society forced it. Um, we may not. I, I think we were probably were lucky. Well, we had um, to force it. Trying to, to yes. We had to force it. We yes. were the ones who brought the attention that we want to see the contract. No, we, People may have that, forgotten, what, but we did that. No, 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 that's all right. Um, take the credit, <laughs> fine. <But laughs> we, we are saying that I, I said civil society. The, the, the fact is we do have all these laws. We do have Friends, Open Society Foundation. We, we, we have Brother Tutu. Um, I almost said Archbishop. <laughs> <laughs> yes. He's good. He's not that good. <laughs> if I can stick something in there, uh, notwithstanding the I'm going to bring it to you back to talk. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> go on, notwithstanding go on, the argument Fred is making, um, and I understand that in certain, certain cases, you have certain things happening. But if we're comparing Equatorial Guinea to Guyana, then it we can't compare it on one or two issues. For example, he's an enemy of the state for speaking up. We are not. He, were, he was a few yes, mornings but, ago. But nobody <laughs> was trying to throw him in prison. And people have been thrown into prison. Yes. But it's, it's, it's not agreed. like, you know, I'm, I'm, you know, you're not looking over your shoulder agreed. all the time to see who is going. So if we look at the total package, I don't think it's the same starting position. I, I, I didn't take. I, I, I thought Fred was no, um, trying to make a point. point. Yes, That's he was trying to make a point by going to the extreme. He was, making, it, he was but making it I don't think it's I don't think so it's I had to, <laughs> I had to <laughs> say that. That's right. right. Um, I'm sorry, as moderator, I didn't come to your, your assistance. <laughs> now, I want to get uh, on, on um, the experiences. Now, on contracts have certain features. First of all, there are different types of contracts. We seem to have been locked in, in Guyana, to the production sharing agreement. I think um, Equatorial Guinea has the uh, uh, same kind yes, of, yes. of model. Um, there are certain features. And I am wondering whether at some point in time, the, whether we will seek some kind of consultation or assistance to see to what extent our contract meets some of the basic elements of fairness to mm -hmm. us as the host country and to the oil company as the operator and the, the, the risk taker and you know we look um this issue you you've got issues of royalty what's a reasonable royalty on the production sharing agreement um what kind of bonuses ought to be paid do you have a signing bonus um do you then have a, um, a, whenever there's a discovery that you have a bonus, then you have a bonus in production? What do you do? Taxation, what do you do? Profit share in the production sharing agreement. 
ha have we gone overboard by saying to the oil company, look, you don't have to pay any taxes here. We'll pay the taxes for you. What, what would you, um, Sarah, I, I don't know what your, your detailed knowledge of these matters are. Um, to do you, you probably have some. What, what, what are some of the features in your own country? If you could sum up, based on those headings I just um, inadequately mentioned. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I th uh, when, when oil was discovered in my country, as I mentioned, there were no laws. Yes. And the companies were indeed taking a huge risk. Spanish companies had come through and concluded there was no oil. So by the time the first company came, and this was a very small company out of Texas, Walter Energy, came and decided to take that risk, they did it, uh, they agreed with the government that the government would take in royalties between 10 and 13 percent. By the time Chevron Texaco purchased the assets of uh, Walter Energy, there were a few other smaller companies, CMS, Nomeco, and others, they also sold to bigger companies. By the time those second contracts were negotiated with bigger companies, the government pushed that up from 10 to 13 percent to 15 to 20 percent, right? Um, and since then, right now, when you look at the law, when you look at the oil law in Equatorial Guinea, which, as I mentioned earlier, were signed post facto, basically, in 2006, uh, you see that it says, you know, that in royalties, the country should get at least, at least 13%. Uh, and in practice, um, from people that have seen some of those, co those, those contracts tell me that you know, most, more, they are in the range of 25 to 45%. You know what our, our um, royalty is? I have not seen it's the contract, but I have been told it's 2%. Which what's, your, what's your view on that? So I don't know what risks uh, Exxon was taking. But let me it tell seems you this. to me if, if there were, there's oil in, in uh, Suriname, there's oil in Venezuela, which was the argument that my government was making to companies coming there. The likelihood of there is oil over here is very high. But and if that is true, and I'm not a geologist, it seems to me logical. That, uh, logical that the right people at the table would have wanted to negotiate for a higher royalty. That's, that, that's what it seems to me, right? However, I haven't seen the law. I don't know this area, I don't know who was negotiating those contracts, and I feel unqualified to comment as to you know, whether they should have asked for But in Equatorial Guinea, if I'm negotiating a, a contract with ExxonMobil under those conditions that appear to have been through here, we definitely have to push for more. I shouldn't in, in, um, intervene when you're speaking. Uh, tell us about some of the other features. So the other features, All the features of, the, of, the, uh, of the. I think the, 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 the. You have a, a single standard contract, or, or, or every operator negotiates a separate contract. Every uh, operator has negotiated a separate contract. Mm -hmm. um, one of the biggest features that I find unconscionable uh, in Equatorial Guinea are the, are the uh, provisions having to do deal with um, um, national content. Companies have been operating in my country now for three decades, and there isn't one single trained engineer or economist, a geologist uh, that any of these companies can claim they have trained. There are several people that have gone on their own to the US, to Spain, Cameroon, and gotten a degree and come back, and the companies have sent them to Houston, primarily, to be specialized in something. So that they have done. Uh, the latest number I got from one of those companies, Hess, which has now sold its assets to Cosmos, Together. Cosmos and Tri... Huh? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and they're coming yeah. here, yes. Mm -hmm. They have five, they five people that they have taken from a basic, um, in the U.S. we call it undergraduate degree. I don't know what's the equivalent in this system, to give them extra training of a, of a year. That tells me that you know, this is a company that's not investing, there's no knowledge transfer, there's no, you know, so that's one. Uh, connected to that, you know, is all the top levels, all the top level jobs at any of these companies in my country is occupied by Americans that come primarily from Texas. And second tier is mostly uh, people from Cameroon, Angola, Nigeria, countries that have experience with oil. 
They would expect that the last year uh, would be Equatoguineans. Instead, these whole companies bring um, workers from the Philippines to Equatorial Guinea to occupy those low-level jobs. Why does your, gov your government permit that? Why, you do why does your government permit it? That's a very good question. My, my uh, guess, uh, two, two things. One, you don't develop a middle class, a group of people that obviously all of a sudden can send their kids to school, give them better education, and can start questioning some of these things. The other one, you don't, you don't have a work uh, uh, working class, a group of workers that can ever organize or could ever demand any better standards, you know, labor standards, employment standards, etc. Yeah. And it keeps, it keeps the community poor, it keeps everybody poor, it keeps everyone dependent on the government for job for handouts. We talked about royalty. What would what would things like bonuses, signing bonus, production bonus? Uh, yeah. So, uh, as soon as oil was discovered in Equatorial Guinea, Obiang uh, declared any matter having to do with oil as a state secret, uh, including the budgets of the National Petroleum Company, Hey Petrol, or the gas company. So we know that signing bonuses were paid. We don't know how much, in what quantity, etc. Does it, does it, does the law that that, that you have now introduced in your country provide for for, for some kind of basic signing bonus? No, it doesn't. It's so not it's purely negotiated. Yes, Chen, and therefore subject to corruption. Subject to corruption, which is, I mean, and, and Sarah alluded to this. By the time we discovered, or by the time I got engaged in this work. Uh, we, I got engaged because, you know, we have found out uh, from uh, the U.S. Senate investigations that $700 million were in the bank, in Rick's Bank in Washington, D.C., and only Theodore, only the President and his son could sign on that account. And that uh, the son has had uh, acquired, you know, a $38 million private jet and a $30 million mansion in Malibu. You know, so at that, by that point, you know, the, the damage has been done, sadly. You, you mentioned uh, your national oil company. Does it have an automatic stay in any oil con contracts and any oil arrangements? Yes. And what percentage is that? Um, I think it's between 13 and 45, depending on what they negotiated. But you know, those are the, and, and this this is fundamentally a problem, right? That you know, when citizens do not know, when no one in Parliament knows these arrangements. That still uh, that still obtains. Yes. That these are confident. Yeah, yeah. In this day and age, Sarah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, that doesn't sound like an open society <laughs> <laughs> preference at all. Certainly not. We would agree with you there. Um, w one thing I wanted to add on this on, on this issue of contracts, and um, we would certainly never comment on um, the contract here. It's that's not our role. We want to support those who, who actually live here um, to, to address those matters. But to, to us, it's asking, was this negotiated with equal bargaining power? Is that possible? In the, in, well, <laughs> let's try to close the gap, right? Yeah. And I think that's something that we, we think we might be able to help with. And, mm -hmm. you know, like I said, we work with governments and civil society. We also want to close that technical gap for civil society in, in being able to analyze the contract terms. Mm -hmm. So I think um, not just here in Guyana, but elsewhere, we, we try to work with all parties to make sure that the, you do get the best contract possible if everybody, certainly maybe not equal uh, playing field, but more equal than what we currently see often. I'll come back to you, um, Tudor. The, because of this confidentiality or secrecy is probably a better mm -hmm. word, um, yes. and concealment are probably, probably after mm -hmm. it is. yes, <laughs> yes, better terms. Um, do you know whether you can, you can renegotiate a contract or, or whether there is some ironclad stability clause that prevents any renegotiation? We don't know. We don't know, and again, this this is. Uh, I mean, I think my presence here, you know, is precisely to let people know. I mean, hopefully, I don't have to come back here to warn people, but rather to celebrate. Well, please come back, come, right? <laughs> uh, but to celebrate, right? Because you know, the fact that we're here means that you know people will be asking those questions, you know, and looking at my understanding from talking to Fred today. In fact, you know, is that you have access to the beginning of the contract and to the end, and there is a media section that is missing. And so I was talking after information that has been put in the national newspapers 
by a columnist named Christopher Lang. Yeah. <laughs> so, so there are no reliable <laughs> columnists. <laughs> <laughs> the bridging agreement is missing. Yes, it is very much the, so. There are serious questions about our contracts that we don't know, and until we get a different, quite frankly, until we get a different leadership, a different government in place, you won't know. As of now, the, the, the so the minister of mine of my country is the son of the president, Gabriel Lima. The vice president of my country is the son of the president, Teodoro Ngema Biang. And, and so you have all these key positions, Ministry of Finance, etc. They are family members, and I'm not saying friends, body, body, son of the president, brother of the president. So a lot of information that citizens need to know is next to impossible to get because, you know, what we have in Equatorial Guinea is not a government, but rather, uh, rather, rather a mafia group. Right, rather a family that run exactly like the Godfather from the movie, like 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 a mafia family. You know, we have had our own problems with um, with democracy, but I think we bless not to have had that kind of issue. I want to. Th I, I was wondering though. Yes, there is a confidentiality or a secrecy clause, mm -hmm. um, but if the all companies are society minded some corporate social responsibility some moral obligation that look we are in these people's country their government is treating them badly by deprivation of a right mm -hmm. a right to information in my view is pro is as fundamental perhaps as deprivation of a job mm -hmm. are the all companies willing to work with civil society in those circumstances in your country. Mm -hmm. So I, I think I want to reemphasize something that Sarah said earlier, right? You know, I think companies can be a force for good. Yes, you right? do. You do. Uh, unfortunately, in my country, that has not turned out to be the case. Um, there, there, there are ways to engage in advocacy with shareholders. Is Exxon Mobil one of those countries? Companies? Unfortunately, yes. Yes. Hess is one of them. Marathon is another one. Noble Energy is another one. Seen up next in? No. They're not. No. Um, so there are ways in which citizens can engage in advocacy. Perhaps it might take uh, going to New York, Washington, or Texas, where many of the shareholders of these companies um, reside or have their meetings. There are ways in which, through um, uh, huge organizations that engage in this type of work, you can insert. Uh, recommendations and language into documents that go to these old companies that, you know, I would highly encourage those that have the energy and the resources to do so in Guyana to start advocating in that in that way. Because, you know, as, as you noted earlier, you know, many of these contracts do have ironclad clauses that prevent any sort of change, even when governments change, right? So, but I have to think that, you know, many of these people, you know, go to church and pray two, three times a day and, you know, can change their mind about something under the right conditions. I'm not a praying man, but, you know, those people that pray, my sister who is a nun tells me that, you know, miracles are possible. <laughs> <laughs> um, have you witnessed that kind of miracle in these types of relationships? <laughs> you know, I've been doing this, I've only been doing this for 15 years, so there's still time. Um, one thing, though, that is that we haven't talked about here tonight is the Extractive Industries Transparency Initiative. Yes. And I'm you glad know, I've written number them. Yes, yeah. um, that failed in in Equatorial mm -hmm. Guinea, um, mostly due to the fact that the government did not allow civil society to operate freely as as part of um, that process, which is not the case here in Guyana. And that while there is not a requirement for contract transparency in EITI, there is a a strong nudge towards disclosing contracts. So I think it's also using the commitments that this government has already signed up to mm -hmm. and holding them to it. And EITI can be an incredibly valuable tool to work with the government and companies in a collaborative manner. I mean, mm -hmm. it is mandated as part of that initiative that civil society companies and governments are all sitting at the table together hashing things out. And, um, you know, there's obviously not a requirement for contract transparency, but there is for beneficial ownership information, so information about who is behind the companies, and lots of information about the revenues generated, so. We've just got one and a half minutes. Mm -hmm. Yes. 15 seconds each. 
Really? It's time has gone that it much. It has gone. You saw the sig you saw the signal just now. Oh no no! I was focusing on what. Uh, <laughs> and you're finishing your fifth <laughs> Fred. I haven't started. You can have mine. No no! It's television time. Uh, we we don't have extras. Well um. In fact, um, the question, going back to the question of how badly we were compared to what um, I would like to end by saying that I really wasn't being facetious at all, because um, in the final analysis, the word is concealment. We have asked, in, in, in transparency, we have asked, well, which trumps which? You say you have a with laws act. And you say that Some you words have a we clause. don't use on this program, Trump is one. Trump, Trump, ah, yes. But um, <laughs> I was talking about the cards. Yeah, the, no, and, and you have a, 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 a rule that says you, 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 you are, you're free to, dis not, you can't disclose, you can't yes. disclose information. So we ask, well, which, um, which, which, which class trumps which? And we get a response that's saying that says everybody else has a uh, class. So I don't know that it is so clear that we are worse off than this gentleman. I'll still give you 15 seconds, Eva. Thank you for having me. <laughs> That's three seconds. <laughs> so whether oil becomes a blessing or curse depends on a lot for your viewers. And now highly encourage them to get engaged. Find ways to get in touch with these two gentlemen. I want to come back to Guyana. And I want to come back because we're celebrating that oil has become a blessing. Um, I, I just want to recognize that there are many others in civil society doing good work. We would like to partner with them to get this common <coughs> voice um, from a civil society perspective going. Well, Dr. Troy Thomas, Mr. Tutu Alicante, Ms. Sarah Bray, um, Mr. Fred Collins, thank you so very much. Um, I'm sorry the time ran out as quickly as it did, and there were so many other issues I would have liked to raise. I'd like to thank the operators and viewers. Thank uh, once again. Good night, and I'll see you next week. Wow.